This Week in Startups is brought to you by Dell for Entrepreneurs. Level up your hardware today and save up to 43% by going to dell.com slash twist. Klaviyo helps brands build relationships across any distance, delivering email marketing moments your customers will appreciate, remember, and share. Visit klaviyo.com slash twist to start your free trial. That's K-L-A-V-I-Y-O dot com slash twist. And Silicon Valley Bank, who, in partnership with Founders Pledge, has formed the COVID-19 Global Impact and Innovation Fund. This fund will deliver resources directly to organizations that can help make the most immediate impact in the fight against COVID-19. Learn more at svb.com slash impact. Hey, welcome to This Week in Startups. It's your boy, Jason Calacanis, here in the middle of the pandemic. It's Friday, May 1st, 2020. We found out that our pandemic stay-at-home order here in the Bay Area will be extended through the month of May, and we may get back to some normalcy in June. This has been, I think I started my quarantine on the 12th of March, so all of April, almost all of March, and now almost all of June. So this is going to wind up being a 10-week-plus quarantine for me, and I'll be honest, uh, not easy for me because I like people and I like being out there and I hate um, not going out and doing things. And so it's been particularly challenging for me, but it's been really nice to connect with all of you and do this podcast. And it's made me appreciate the podcast and the community even more. I mean, I always just love the fact that some of you stop me on the street or see me at a conference or drop me an email or write a review on iTunes and, and tell me that the show or some guest inspired you, or you learned something from it, or just kept you entertained on some hike or something. Boy, you know, that is something as a uh, performer or a host of a show that really fills your fills your bucket and charges your batteries. But I wasn't prepared for the amount of warmth, love, and camaraderie I felt when we started our Slack channel. And I just want to thank everybody for showing up in the Slack and talking to me. And a lot of you are like, wow, it's amazing that you responded. Uh, it's amazing you showed up and I appreciate it. I appreciate all of you for listening to the podcast and showing up for me. This is a two-way street. This is how I get my energy. This is how I get my motivation in life is doing the show. And so I think when these crises happen, you, you do a little self-reflection. You look at your work, you look at your life, you look at your friendships and boy, am I a blessed individual. But I may have taken for granted the audience of This Week in Startups because I don't see you all the time, right? You just download from some RSS feed, some MP3 file, you listen to it. And, you know, you, you're you're sometimes mistaken as a podcaster because you see a bunch of links. You see a bunch of metrics and stats. A couple of thousand views here, tens of thousands of you here, a couple of hundred thousand views overall. But you forget each of those views is a human. And if you want to join those humans, you go to thisweekinstartups.com slash Slack and you join. And a community has formed. Over 20,000 founders in there. And we did an AMA or two. And we have book club. And we just finished our first book. And I have to tell you, the Slack channel, as good as this podcast has been over a thousand episode, uh, episodes, after two weeks, the Slack channel, I think is as valuable. And in some cases, people might be getting more value from that than the actual podcast. People have told me they've made business contacts. They've made friends. They've had intelligent conversations. They've gotten great advice. And it's not me, it's you. It's all of you as a community. And so I'm just absolutely enthralled. Uh, and I can't wait when I click on the icon in my Slack to, to see what y'all are talking about in there. Whether it's the book channel, or the small wins channel, or I'm gonna kick ass today channel. Um, sometimes I pop into the Australian or Chicago channels and just say hi to friends. Uh, London, big presence in London, uh, the growth hacking channel, all of this stuff is just great. And I was very concerned that this podcast would have uh, would struggle because I thought, God, in order to have a good podcast, I got to look into the eyes of the guest. But we haven't missed a beat. Team here has done a great job of moving this to virtual. And today's guest um, has a company uh, and a lot of experience in the virtual. He worked at Google. He worked uh, with my friend Evan Williams and my other friend Biz Stone over at Medium. 
which is called Obvious Corporation. Now he's got his own co company called Range.co. Uh, no M there. It's a Range.co, the great CO domain like I use for launch.co. And uh, he's the CEO and co-founder. His name is Daniel Pew Pius. Pew Pius. Daniel, welcome to the program. And how did I do in butchering your name? You did a very good job. It's, uh, people really struggle with the uh, the pronunciation there, so thank you. Well, it's it's spelled P U P I U S, Pew Pius. Um, mm -hmm. And and I asked you earlier, like, is it Greek? It feels Greek to me. Um, it's, well, it's of a Lithuanian descent, um, but I, my ancestors came over to the UK in around 1905, so it's quite likely it was corrupted during the immigration process. Ah. Um, we did, and we did try and track down relatives in Lithuania. Um, in the 90s and um, couldn't, didn't have any luck. But interestingly, since Facebook, a few people have popped up with, uh, with the surname. Amazing. Same thing happened to my family. Calicanis uh, is Calicanis with Ks. It means to have done well or well done. And when they went through Ellis Island, my grandfather, uh, like many folks going through Ellis Island, they just wrote down whatever you said as best they could and told you to keep moving because there was a line. Uh, yep. Tell me, what is range.co? Welcome to the program. Hi, yeah. Um, so Range, um, we're calling it Team Success Software. Uh, essentially, it's what I wished I had when I was running Teams at Medium and Google. Um, it's uh, an asynchronous communication platform um, that keeps teams connected wherever they are. So at the core is a daily check-in. It's a bit like a virtual stand-up, um, except we integrate with all your tools. So it's really easy to remember what you're doing and what, you have, um, what you've done. And then we have some culture building components built in. Um, so we have companies like Twitter, Carter, Medium, and they use it to stay in sync, focus on what matters, and also build trust across the team. Let, let's talk about the asynchronous nature of that. Mm -hmm. You were very specific to, to qualify it as asynchronous. Explain to people who maybe know what that word yeah. means, but don't know in this context what that means, and why is that so important? Yeah, so a lot of work practice historically relied on this face-to-face -face synchronous communication. So synchronous means back and forth, you're doing it at the same time. And those practices have then moved online. So synchronous ch chat, Slack is very synchronous. You can catch up after the fact, but most of the time people use it as a conversation. Zoom, of course, is um, synchronous. You know, you and I are chatting back and forth now at the same time. So asynchronous just means that you are not present at the interface at the same moment. So an email is asynchronous. I send an email and you receive it an hour later, 12 hours later, it doesn't matter. Um, with range, you do these check-ins or you do objective updates. And um, you, then your team can uh, catch up on the work um, whenever suits them. So as it fits their schedule. I was going to say it's really important for remote teams because it's really hard to be in the same place at the same time. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're often time displaced as well as geographically displaced. So if you're in different time zones or you're on different working schedules, um, you want to stay in sync, um, async. <laughs> yeah, and you don't want to interrupt each other. That is a constant complaint about right. Slack. And Slack has spent a lot of time building sophisticated tools for notifications that nobody understands, nobody mm -hmm. reads, and create massive chaos, I find, um, where people are just like, oh, you know, stop using channels, stop using at here, stop letting everybody know. And then people are like, well, why don't you set your settings and learn how to do that? And right. so there's a little bit of an onboarding thing. Did you make range.co for um, remote work in mind or uh, you know, agnostic to work? So, so we started a few years ago, and remote work has definitely been on the on the climb. But we we're agnostic in terms of where you are located. One of the core ideas is around um, work is getting more complex, and the complexity is based on different factors. So it might be a cross-functional team instead of a purely functional team. It might be remote or multiple time zones, or it might be the nature of the work is more complex. So as the work gets more complex, it becomes more difficult to stay stay in, stay connected and stay um, and to coordinate your activities. So Rangers built that within my, uh, with that in mind. And when you, that said, so I was going to say that said even before COVID, um, around two thirds of our customers spanned multiple time zones. So it definitely resonated with remote teams um, a lot. And this uh, f functional versus cross functional, if I'm mm -hmm. correct in defining that. You're part of the design team. I'm part of the development team. There's a sales team. They tend mm -hmm. to function really well when you're in your tribe, when you're in your group, because you have a common language, you have a common ethos, typically, maybe even personalities. The sales team's a certain way. The development team's a certain way. Um, you have your own stand-ups where you explicitly say what you're working on. 
But cross-functional, when the sales team and the product team and the design team and the marketing team all have to get on the call at the same time, that's when things start to break down, isn't it? Yeah, and and I think the potentially the challenge or the irony is that um, the cross-functional collaboration is where the magic happens. And that's when you can move much more quickly and be much more adaptive to the environment that you're working in. So startups are inherently cross-functional. And then even if you look at most product development teams, they, they no longer operate in these functional silos. You don't have a waterfall model where product hands off to design, design hands off to engineer, and there's not any collaboration. The, you have a work unit who are focusing on um, a deliverable or some output, and they work together as a team. So the, the notion of a team is very important here. And you had mentioned something about the, the core function of this product uh, range being the sort of... I don't know if task management or your to do mm -hmm. list for the day, your intentionality. What do you call it when people explicitly state, here's what I'm going to get done today? And is that the key feature of the software? Is that what the, everything revolves around? Is that the key piece of data? Yeah, we, we call that the anchor habit. Um, it's this core, core behavior, this core loop. Um, and it has a bunch of really nice properties. So for an individual, um, you can collect all the things that are on your plate from across the different tools. So you, sit, you say, these are my calendar events, these are my Asana tasks, these are the GitHub issues that are assigned to me. And you bring those together and, and plan your day out. And then you can reflect on what you did yesterday and um, kind of celebrate it, like all the docs you edited, all the meetings you had, the interviews, the code you submitted. And that makes you feel accomplished. And then the pr process of sharing that with the team then creates transparency and access to information. So instead of me saying, um, I worked on this um, one login thing for Airbnb. You can dig straight into the the Git commit or the the design doc that I was working on without having to ask me where to find it. So it has some really nice properties. Um, ah, so that that's interesting. Loop. It's like you're anticipating that when I state what I did today, people are going to have a question, and by linking to it and anticipating your boss's question or your co collaborator or your adjacent leader in another group. Uh, and the cross functionality, cross function group, you're anticipating they might want to dr drill down into that new mm -hmm. feature, maybe look at the spec, maybe look at the result, maybe look at the designs, and you could link to the Envision, the GitHub, the to do list, the Notion page, whatever it is. Yeah, I think one of the challenges with knowledge management in general is like, I don't know what's interesting to you. Um, and then there's multiple stakeholders, especially in these really, really complex teams as product managers, as designers, as engineering managers, as executives, as the you know, the, the IT team. So I don't know what part of my work is interesting to whom. So if I can push that out in a relatively um, like like high fidelity way, people can then pick and choose and have access to the information that's important to them. So it's much more of a kind of like um, publish subscribe model than a, um, than a sort of a, you know, direct distribution model of this information is important to you. All right, when we get back from this quick break, I know you worked at Google on Gmail uh, and you worked on the Google Plus, the failed gigantic huge white whale of a project and you got looped into that i want to hear all about that and how it informed what you're doing with range when we get back on this week in startups have you been itching to upgrade your workstation well dell for entrepreneurs wants to help you level up your tech hardware it was created to support founders by providing resources and tools that help startups grow and scale their technology scaling your company means more than just hiring means getting high quality laptops, network storage and printers to provide your employees with the best tools to succeed. I use this and I have used it for years, the Dell 38 inch curved ultra sharp monitor. Why do I use this? Why do I give one to every team member for the office and for home? Because with a little USB-C plug into your laptop, boom, your desktop expands. You can have three giant windows open, Slack over here, Notion over here. Uh, and it makes people feel great when they have that giant monitor and they don't have to task switch. That's just one of the many options you can get with Dell for Entrepreneurs. Founders that register for Dell for Entrepreneurs have a wide range of free resources for startups, such as free IT consulting from experts who are ready to help you with any IT related questions. You get access to capital for buying hardware. With Dell Financial Services, founders can qualify for financing their entire IT project and pay it back in low monthly payments so you don't burn that precious cash. And rewards like earning up to 6% cash back on Dell products. Every founder should take advantage of this program now. Level up your hardware today and save up to 43% 
by going to dell.com slash twist and registering for Dell for Entrepreneurs. That's dell.com slash twist today to save up to 43% and get this amazing Dell monitor. I actually have a 49 one inch one at home. That one is bonkers. I have two computers plugged into it simultaneously. So we can have two different sessions going for two different projects I'm working on. It's a crazy way to do it. Um, you don't have to go that far. I think you just go with the 38. But if you want to go crazy like me, get the 49 inch. That's the future. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. All right, welcome back to This Week in Startups. It's May 1st, 2020, if you're listening to this 100 years in the future. Uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic. It's called coronavirus, COVID-19. And we're in, uh, God, I don't know, six, seven weeks into a stay-at-home order here. And my guest today, virtually over the Zoom, is Daniel Pupias. Uh, he is on the Twitter, DPUP, if you want to follow him, uh, Four Letter Club. And uh, the company is Range.Sia, which he's been working on for the last couple of years. They've raised a little bit of money from uh, some known suspects like uh, First Round and General Catalyst uh, and Bloomberg Beta, a bunch of our friends in there. Um, and, Il and Ellen Pow as well, interesting. Um, we're trying to get her onto the podcast for a while, but she's, she's kind of podcast shy. Um, so you worked at Google. Mm -hmm, that's right. And uh, you worked on Gmail chat. I know that. And you worked on, you got looped into Google Plus. Mm -hmm. For people who don't know, Google got obsessed with the ascension of Facebook at a certain point. They decided to pour a couple billion dollars into having a coexister, maybe not a killer, but at least a coexister, having a stake in social media. So they created plus.google.com. Um, eventually it got uh, turned off. It did get some decent traction and had some amazing world-class design and functionality. Tell me uh, first um, how you got looped into that. Tell us that story. And then ultimately yeah. why you think it failed. I have my own, oh, wow. I have two theories <laughs> myself, which I'll get into, but uh, you tell me yours. Yeah, I, I think it's a really interesting um, story, and I'm very curious what the the internet historians will make of make of it when they bring everything together. Um, but I was on the the Gmail team. I had um, an infrastructure group who were building um, the foundation for the next gen Gmail infrastructure. And Google Buzz, I'm not sure if you remember Buzz, but Buzz sure. just um, shut down, and then Google was trying to figure out what the social um, the social thing looks like. Take a moment to explain Buzz because that to me was an unbelievably cool experiment. Yeah, it was it was born out of um, the status the status update in Gmail chat where it basically became this log and then people could have conversations around it. So it was this it was right inside Gmail and it became like a really cool thing that we used inside Google. Um, and then there were just a few hiccups around the rollout and around access to information that um, caused it to be shut down. But it was a very interesting idea and I really liked that it was part of um, the, the main Gmail UI and so integrated with. Uh, with the chat product. If I remember correctly, you'd be in Gmail. Everybody knows on the bottom left, you have this uh, chat functionality that you worked mm -hmm. on, but then Buzz kind of went in between it and you could have this like threaded discussion and it automatically popped up a social network based mm -hmm. upon your inbox or based upon your, yep. your address book. Yeah, basically, yeah. So instead of uploading your address book to Facebook, uploading it to LinkedIn and having it build the network there, it was like, well, why not just turn on the network that's right here? The problem was, is somebody had a stalker in their email box or somebody had a an ex who was abusive. That, I think that was the case that uh, somebody wrote a blog post about that got a lot of press. Popping up an instant social network, you may not want to be in a social network with your abusive ex, right? That was the thing that killed it and made everybody freak out was that the permission wasn't explicitly granted mm -hmm. to build a pop-up social network, correct? Yeah, exactly. That was the, the main problem. Now, Zuckerberg would not have had a problem with that. He would have just done it. I think that's, the people at Google actually cared and were very considered about having done this uh, and moving fast and maybe breaking some things in the process, right? I think it's expectations and trust. So Gmail was, at that point was a very established product. It had a lot of users. People relied on it and had these expectations about how it functioned. So it's natural for a product team to want to think about how can you deliver more value to your existing customer base. Um, yeah, but then the, the, it broke user trust because the, the users had this like ex expectation about the contract that you know, Gmail is private, it's private email, that they're in control. And, and, and that was, the, that was the ultimate, the, the issue. Why didn't it 
why didn't you then flip it to, or didn't the team flip it to, here's Google Buzz. You click on it and it says, mm -hmm. Google Buzz will take your address book and build a social network out of it. Um, so you can see what your friends are up to. Currently, 13 of your 100 most trusted friends are using it. Click here yeah. to join the fun. And when you click to join the fun, it says, these are the 100 people you're going to be connected with. Please remove anybody you don't mm -hmm. want. Did, did the team fight for that, actually, and not and get shut down? Um, Honestly, that was above my pay grade. Um, I, w I was. Oh, you were just building it. <laughs> I was working on infrastructure to support the product wow. teams. So, so I was thinking about the the strategy of how how all the pieces fit together um, and delivering them um, the 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 building blocks for for the applications. Well, what do you think of my idea as an approach to the product launch? Obviously, you're a very sophisticated product person. Do, would that not have worked? Should they have kept doing that? Yeah, I think it's I think it's difficult to figure out how to backpedal and whether the trust was um, oh, completely broken at that point, and then you have to backpedal even further than um, than Nestle you wished. Um, so some of the theory I think was then to go off and create a separate product which mm -hmm. had some of the properties of Google Buzz, but then also integrated features that were previously in Google um, I Go in I in I Google. Mm. Um, See, this is the the actual core of, so I believe, Silicon Valley's moral compass issues. Mm -hmm. If you're a good actor and you shut the thing down because you made an honest mistake and you broke trust, and then you're up against a competitor who does not care about trust, cares only about growth, it is almost impossible to win. And that competitor is obviously Zuckerberg who allowed people to auto-join groups. And you probably remember this. He created a product where I could add you to a group, and the day that this thing came out, they added Mike Arrington, the former editor of TechCrunch, Zuckerberg, and myself to NAMBLA, the National Man Boy Love Association, like a pedophile group. They created a fake pedophile group and added us to it. And you know what Zuckerberg's response to that was? <laughs> Only your friends can do that. And, and everybody was like, well, yeah, but why don't you just make it opt in? And he's like, well, you should just have better friends who don't do stuff yeah. like that. And it's like, that's the competitor Google was up against, right? I want, I want, I want to hear your thoughts on that as like a, the, the Zuckerberg competitor and, and competing against that level of product velocity, that level of move fast, break things. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it goes back to just the you know the core the core values of the company and the, and the and the history. And Google had been built out of a very different. It was a very technical culture. Uh, they didn't really understand social in the way that um, Mark does, um, and. Uh, yeah, I think it was a very difficult situation for them to navigate. And there was a lot of internal discussions and there's huge teams dedicated to this, lots of stakeholders, very complex efforts that were very challenging. Yeah. So explain to how Google Plus then came to be. Because Google yeah, so Buzz, I guess you had some, that mm -hmm. gave everybody like a little bit of hope, like, hey, we can build a cool product. Yeah. I, I mean, I think there was, there was this interesting moment where um, there was, there was, visibility into the possibility of what what Google could do and there's excitement about um, the type of product we could build. There's some really great product thinkers and designers and engineers. So it was this amalgamation of teams that came together, people out of um, iGoogle, which was starting to have some social elements and then the, the, the Buzz team. Um, and then, um, you know, Vic came along and um, took, took over leadership of the effort. And we had this 100 day 100 day sprint to, to, to ship something and it was just like a, a huge effort. At one point we had 280 people contributing code to the same JavaScript binary, which at that time was really unheard of. Um, so it was, it was, it was, it was pretty, a pretty wild effort. Yeah, thousands of developer, thousands of people eventually were on the Google Plus team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, tangentially, yeah. Now the product was growing like crazy because Google decided to put it in the toolbar in the top right. And plus, so people, if they don't remember, plus was if you like something in the blogosphere or other places, you would put plus one. Mm -hmm. So it was just a, that the original star or thumbs up or like was plus one. So if you were in favor of something, you'd say plus one, like add one to that, right? It was a very clever, very Google on brand mm -hmm. for Google. What was it that made, in your opinion, Google plus not work? despite the fact that it got a lot of users. <laughs> I think ultimately all these things are become organizational failures. And in the case of Google+, I think the values and the vision of the people 
on the ground building a product diverge from the vision and values of the people leading uh, mm -hmm. and that that dichotomy created a bunch of tension and meant meant that we were both we were ineffective and um, eventually couldn't sustain and i think there's a, a number of examples but the most sort of public example is the real names policy um, which um, there's a lot of external um, press about this and internally there's a huge amount of furor and a lot of googlers really were against the real names policy um, and but you know it was an executive decision to to stick with it and then ultimately explain they we had the, to explain again, what, what, the, what the real names policy is yeah the real names policy was that you you, could, you couldn't create a pseudon pseudonymous account you had to have an account which represented your real human name so i would only be able to shop as daniel p Pius, which for me is is fine and i i have a public persona that is um is, is on all my social products but for a lot of people that isn't safe and causes a bunch of issues and one of the powers in the early web was that people could have multiple personas and multiple um like pseudonyms so in one community you might be like i had a like i was lazarus in one community i'd be deep up in another and in another i'd be like a different um persona and that was like a really powerful construct in the early web that um, a lot of google has really really liked and then as you look at um people from different backgrounds and different um, social situations, being able to show up in a social product not with your real name is, is like a requirement, and essentially a safety requirement. Um, so that was why the, 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 the inter internally, a lot of people didn't support the real names policy. Yeah, and, and if you, you, you peel back the onion even more and take a deeper look at it, we're in San Francisco, where there are groups of people um, who just showing up and existing in the world um, could be beaten and murdered uh, mm -hmm. trans people, gay people, marginalized people, right. like their their very existence could on one of these social networks could lead to massive harassment. And yep, the exactly. only reason to not attach your real name to it is advertising or you want to maintain the integrity of the network. Like you could, there's other ways to deal with that that are very simple. You can allow people to have a pseudonym and if they behave badly, just look at the behavior as opposed to mm -hmm. looking at the name, right? Like, yeah. I think there's a theory that if people, which I don't agree with, but if people had their real name associated with the account, they would behave better. So the quality of the discourse would be higher. And I think- Yeah, how's that, that going? Ten, ten, I think 10 years on, that has been distinctly proven false. I, you know, that was one I think I, I got partially wrong because I was thinking about normal level-headed people. So you're like, mm -hmm. well, a level-headed person is not going to say things on LinkedIn with their real name that they might say in a IRC room with a, with a pseudonym. But then we look at Facebook and people are more than willing to say racist stuff or crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. And when you actually get all people onto a social network, the concept that a real name protects you is problematic. Um, although verifying people is is another interesting thing. When we get back to this quick break, I wanna get more into the details of how range works and I will reveal my reasons why I think uh, Google Plus failed. Uh, and I wanna get your feedback on my outsider's view as a social media addict who loved and was one of the, I had 600,000 people following me on mm -hmm. Google Plus. I had, a, I had a real following there and I loved the product. When we get back on the speaking start. In uncertain times, supporting your community and growing relationships with your customers is a strategy that will be appreciated, remembered, and shared. In good times and bad, open and empathetic communication with your customers is key. It's critical. Email is and always will be one of the best channels for delivering these communications. We all know that. Email marketing is one of Klaviyo's core offerings. And when you leverage personalization driven by a 360-degree view of the customer, those emails will feel even more relevant, fostering stronger relationships. Clavio truly understands how challenging it is for each and every entrepreneur to get their business off the ground, let alone navigate trying times like today. If you're feeling overwhelmed and growing your business is hard, especially in this climate, you're not alone. Clavio is here to help brands build relationships across any distance. So here is your call to action. Create meaningful, memorable email marketing moments that last a lifetime. Visit Clavio, that's K-L-A-V-I-Y-O dot com slash T-W-I-S-T to start a free trial. Thanks again to Clavio for supporting independent media like This Week in Startups. Let's get back to this amazing episode. All right, Daniel Pupias is here. He is DPUP. We're having a fascinating discussion, not just about his startup range.co, which helps teams be more productive, especially when they're remote. And we're going to get into some more of the features there and some more thoughts on remote work and best practices when we get to our third act. But we're having a fascinating mm -hmm. discussion about, I guess, recent history, but not history. 
or recent events that have are five or ten years past, uh, like Google's foray into social networking, then which we eventually led with them giving up. I, I had a couple of ideas of why it didn't work, and I and I love the product. I think actually, at the time. Um, Google Plus was a better product than anything else in the market. Just heads up yeah. on features and design and everything. And a lot of people yeah, I'm really proud of what the team built. Yeah, yeah the, te the team did an incredible job. It was gorgeous. It was responsive. It was global. I mean, it was extraordinary. And the the, the circles, uh, people forgot about circles. You could create circles, mm -hmm. which were subset of groups, which eventually Facebook copied with like close friends and the mm -hmm. ability to create friends and family and these sort of things as Zuckerberg is prone to do, like watch whatever features people do and then just try to incrementally make them better or release them. Um, I think the fact that Google Plus did not have its own domain name and brand and destination where they had 100% of the marketing uh, space and interface, I think was a challenge. And I think that plus.google.com or you know, however the domain structure was, was a bit of a mistake because you never had this ability for it to stand alone as the in the way YouTube or Instagram do, um, or Beats does inside of Apple, and having this collection of brands, Xbox inside of Microsoft, um, or even like uh, I'm trying to think, of, uh, like Bing is its own search engine owned by Microsoft, right? And I felt like Google had not figured out that they could have a brand that stood next to Google that was adjacent. How much of that, if they had Plus.com? Do you think that could have changed the dialogue if they said, hey, listen, Plus is over here, Google Search and Gmail are over here, YouTube is over here. These things, you can use the same account to log into them, you can share your address books, there's some commonality, but it is its own thing if you want to use it or not. Yeah, I don't know because there's, there's Orkut, if you remember Orkut, yes. which was really big in um, Brazil and a few other countries in India. Um, a 20% I, I mean, time I, project that Google did. It, yeah, well, it had a team, um, but I, I think... I think it might be related to the adoption pattern. So Google can fast track a huge, huge adoption just by the presence and the, and the, the, as you, as you know, it's in the toolbar. But if you think about Facebook's adoption pattern, it went through the universities and it went through companies, and each of those had essentially a wall-to-wall -wall critical mass within a community. So they got nice saturation within small communities before padding out. Whereas Google, I think, had some saturation within communities, but it, it was generally quite sparse. And that, and if you think about network effects. Hmm. That would be my sense as uh, why, why it didn't take off in necessarily the same way as Facebook. Right. So there might have been a large number of people there because they blasted it to everybody. However, mm -hmm. your tribe might have only 5% of your tribe might have used it. So it felt yeah. like a ghost town. So there were a lot of a lot of people in a small number of communities, Yeah, uh, which made and it I think, feel shallow I, at I, times. I, I, I agree with you that I, I think circles was a really powerful feature. I think it was also a little bit confusing to people because it it's, um, it's with a consumption mode as a way of organizing your consumption of like who shows up in my feed but it's also a way of distributing um content so i'm going to push stuff to my family and then i'm going to consume in my family and it, it kind of blurred two models it was kind of tricky but it was so brilliant it would be as if on twitter um, and this would be such an amazing feature somebody um clip this and send it to the the new product manager over there and at mention him please somebody in the audience uh and and jack imagine if a twitter list if a twitter list had everybody following you could become also a DM list or a share mm -hmm. list in private. So I could have a DM list or I could have a Twitter list that was um, my portfolio companies. And when I tweeted to it, I could ch click, a, click a button and say only to them in DM, mm -hmm. start a DM or send a tweet only to them. And then that would be circled and colored, you know, with a mm -hmm. background and say only for members of this list, a private tweet. Yeah, so I, I could have a private slash public feed going. Too complicated or brilliant? Well, I think one difference with circles was that um, circles would be my list and then you'd have a different list. So they weren't mm. necessarily shared. Right. So it wasn't clear to different mm. people what the group was. So if, if the Twitter list is shared, then you have a clear audience and a clear grouping, which, it, which is then guiding the distribution and the consumption. So I think people need, in social products, people need to know who the audience is, who are you speaking to. Right. Yeah. It was, su it was super cool also that you could have like, you could bring two circles together. So you could share something mm -hmm. with your family and work and then say only work, yep. only family. So you, you had this like really neat way of, I, I created like a tribe for New York, LA and San Francisco. So when I was in each city, mm -hmm. I could say, hey, I'm here. Yep. Anybody want to get coffee? And it was like my, it, it really started to work for yep. me. I invested all of this amount in it. And uh, the other thing I think was 
um, you, you just didn't have, you know, Larry and Sergey, I, m- I remember Sergey like posted twice. Yeah. And he responded to one of my things. I had my my daughter when she was like three years mm-hmm. old eating a slice of pizza. She's like, oh, she loves crust. And, you know, like, I was yep. like, oh, wow, Sergey Brin's on here. Cool, you know. Um, but then that was it, you know, like, and I don't think Larry ever even opened it. <laughs> so if the, yeah. if the leaders of the company are not participating, that does create, I, I think, a little yeah. bit of a tell, right? Yeah, it's the, it's the spoken values and the lived values. So there was, I think this is public knowledge, but there was a, a social bonus where um, the bonus was tied to Google social efforts. So that's spo- speaking as if the, the, that the social is a really core mission, but then the lived and felt values were obviously very different. Um, so I think this goes to just general like, organizational practice in startups is that you have to walk your talk and the spoken values have to map your lived values. And you can yell as loud as you want about what you want people to do, but unless you actually, your actions are guiding and, and your behaviors are guided by the, your true values, people won't follow you and, and they won't pay attention to the, to the things you think they want. That's a really interesting observation. Like, and uh, it, I always say this to founders when they're presenting, you know, show, don't tell show the product mm-hmm. working, show a customer using it. Don't tell us about products using it, your customers using it. In a way, in management, show, don't tell is applicable here as well as just a simpler way to say what you said much more eloquently, which is show that you love the product. I, I thought when mm-hmm. Zuckerberg um, and Joe Green um, did a, like a live where they were making meats and they were smoking meats in their backyard, and it you know became like a whole meme and they made these weird things about smoking meats and sauces or whatever it at least showed that zuckerberg you know as awkward as he is on camera <laughs> was right. willing to be on camera right it's like oh wow they're using it. and then cheryl sandberg um you know she she's she's active on instagram she uses the product right mm-hmm. and that is super important i think that's a really interesting observation yeah. about management I, one thing I wanted to talk to you about was how to, um, you know, with, with your product or without your product, just, you know, big picture and tactical, how does one as a leader and as a team member not have these new tools, whether it's Slack or yours or Asana or Notion, whatever people are choosing to use to keep track of work, how do you keep them from being authoritarian micromanagement um, and big brothers watching versus celebrating, informing coworkers and creating that um, esprit de corps, as they yeah. say. Yeah, I mean, I think it goes to values. Like the tools can be used however you want them and um, they, they, the usage is a manifestation of your value system. So if you want to use these tools as surveillance and overbearing command and control leadership, then you can do it that way. Um, My belief and my hope is that most leaders today don't really want to live that way. And they live that way out of fear. Um, They don't truly believe that, you know, theory X, theory Y, um, leadership theory, that theory X is you're de facto lazy and you need both a carrot and a stick to motivate you. Theory Y is you're inherently motivated to do good work and you just need the conditions to do good work. So I don't think many people believe in theory X anymore, but they act as if they, they act in those ways because they're essentially fearful. They don't know what's happening. They, um, they are worried that they're going to miss targets. They're dependent for things that they maybe can't act on um, themselves. So they become overbearing and they become command and control. So I think my my goal with something like range and these other tools is to create systems which can create visibility and transparency such that those fears don't manifest as much so mm-hmm. i trust that you're doing your work because i see the visibility and i trust that you're doing okay um um like emotionally and um at your job and then then i can actually like relax my my controlling tendencies so that so I, but i think ultimately if if you if you believe people are inherently lazy then uh then you, you can use any of these tools um, in bad ways. And I think for people who have the luxury and the privilege to, to, to work the way they want, they should work with leaders who um, you know, believe in empowerment and believe in transparency and purpose and align themselves with leaders who match their value systems. I, I've been struggling with this because I created my own little lightweight way of doing this, which was, I, you know, mm-hmm. I just started to get overwhelmed with the number of people reporting into me and I don't like micromanaging people. So I said, just send me an EOD end of day report, yep. three or four bullet points by email, 
We moved it to Slack since because people wanted to put it in Slack. And then when we went full virtual, I said, just give me an SOD, start a day and an EO day. Yep. And you can reply to one, you just do the other, just your intention of what you're going to get done today. Yep. The problem with that is, is you know, you run this risk of somebody not having a great EOD and not having mm -hmm. an SOD right. that's inspiring. And what I told everybody is if you feel you your EOD is not where you want it to be, you're not proud of it, you're not enthused about it, talk to these three people in the organization about what else you can do to help the mission and to move the ball forward. Yeah. What one do you think I handled that right? How does one handle the fact that in any organization there are some people coasting? That that's why there is a joke about Huli and the roof and people resting, investing. Mm -hmm. And listen, you worked at Google, you know there's people resting, investing at Google yeah. in a major way. It's part of the culture, actually. So how does one deal with that fact that maybe not everybody is uh, running as hard and getting as much, mm -hmm. making as much impact as other people, and it becomes quite apparent. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's a really huge question. Um, unpack a few pieces. Um, so, so I think. So ultimately, it comes back to motivation and how and, and how are people motivated to, to to act or behave? And there's a bunch of theory around that. So people, I like Daniel Pink's work. So people are motivated by purpose. Uh, they want to have like a north star or like a mission that they're aligned with. They want to have mastery. They want to get good at a craft or get better at what they're doing. And they want to have a level of autonomy. So they, they don't want to be controlled by other people. And in many organizations, people don't honestly know why their work fits into the big picture. They're not getting better. They, they look at their work day to day and it hasn't changed in two months or two years. And they don't have autonomy because they have these people who are controlling them and they're dependent on all these other people. So of course they end up being unmotivated and then they move into these, um, these behaviors that look like they're coasting. Um, so I think that's one element. And then the, but to speak specifically to your start of day, end of day, what I like about these habits is that they create, um, this ritual and if you if you if you're if you can create an environment where people are comfortable giving a start of day or an end of day report that isn't perfect or isn't great then that actually is a really great signal because ah. it means you have psychological safety and then you actually you have this environment where people are able to act without the fear of negative consequences and then as a leader you can then go hey what happened today do you need some help like are you unclear about your priorities or like are you sick do you need to take some time off are you burnt out like you can start having conversations about why there was a gap in expectations and reality and if you don't have that safety then you can't have that conversation and then things get more polarized so people get more anxious they get more re reserved they, they they spend more time trying to look like they're working instead of actually working um so it's this it's this um you know, spiral, spiral into. See, I really uh, like lack, this lack idea of, of people being able to, in their report, say, "Today sucked. I didn't get anything done. It was all blockers and roadblocks, and I was in a funk, and I was exhausted because the kids kept me up at night." Yeah. I, I actually really and, never created the space for that in my EOD, mm -hmm. and I, I think uh, yeah. that's actually a really interesting punch up is to tell people, listen, if it was a, a crummy day. Yep. For the love of God, you know, just say you phoned it. I, it'd be great if somebody's like, listen, I phoned it in today. <laughs> and the boss yeah, was I mean, able to say like, hey, tomorrow's a new day. Because we all know there's days when you're mm -hmm. sitting in front of that computer in the office and, you, and you're there for eight hours, but you're not there. And nothing got done. Even the best people have those days. So if you can create an environment where they can talk about that, that's like the best place to be because then you can start correcting the conditions that led them to have those days. So ultimately, this is actually the rate, the core check and behavior in ranges. Um, we only do it once a day, but it's what's your plan for the day, which is like your EOD, and then what happened previously, which is like your end, of, uh, sorry, start of day, and then what happened previously, which is like your end of day. And then we have some culture components that are, are designed to build um, belonging and connectedness, especially in remote teams. All right, when we get back from this break, I want to talk about building culture remotely if you have a little more time for us when we get back on This Week in Startups. Great guest. As we navigate uncertain times, Silicon Valley Bank believes that collective action is the best way to overcome the challenges we're all up against. This is why Silicon Valley Bank, in partnership with Founders Pledge, has formed the COVID-19 Global Impact and Innovation Fund. The fund will deliver resources directly to organizations around the world that can help make the most immediate impact in the fight against COVID-19. Silicon Valley Bank has made an initial $1 million investment to fund this critical work and invites you to join them in helping those in need. Silicon Valley Bank continues to offer solutions that support small businesses and the innovation economy. 
For more than 35 years, Silicon Valley Bank has supported countless innovators with a passion for solving the world's biggest problems and today remains committed to helping its clients and employees and our communities manage through these uncertain times. To learn more about the Silicon Valley Bank COVID-19 Global Impact and Innovation Fund, visit svb.com slash impact. Again, that's svb.com slash impact. All right, Daniel Pupias is with us. Follow him on the Twitter, D-P-U-P. Like a pew and being pious. Pew pious. Easy D- to remember. D-Pup. D-Pup. The D-Pup. Uh, it's also his rap name. Um, is that your playa uh, name as well, or is it a different playa name? When I'm on the playa. I have playa, not been to the, been to the playa. playa. No. What? But, but you I worked at Google Pup. Medium, obvious? She wow. probably hate me saying this, but my wife went a bunch, and then by the time we were together, um, she was all over it. So I'm really interested in Burning Man 2021. It's either going to be the greatest Burning Man ever or it's going to be terrible. Because having yeah. a thousand or two thousand people dancing tribally around robot hard or whatever it is, like it, it just, yeah, I, I hope yeah, we can do that. It's interesting to think about cyberpunk um, fashion with the pandemic and what does um, like post pandemic like rave outfit look like you've got masks you've probably got um you know it's just very interesting <laughs> yeah i i think we're part of the same generation uh, in terms of cyberpunk did you pre-order the cyber truck from elon or what did you think when you saw uh, it i don't have space in my garage we, we live in a loft so <laughs> yeah but i mean what did you think when you saw that roll out yeah it looked like something out of a computer game yeah I, it's just amazing uh well i'd say also interesting i think um the the Gibson series, Iduru, All Tomorrow's Parties. Mm-hmm. That I don't. You read that one? That whole yeah, all series. of them. Yeah, I've really read, great. Read series. everything by Gibson. Yeah, I mean, it's just amazing. And, and a lot of these young kids don't know him. He's kind of like this. Ni- it's really, really creepy. <laughs> What's that? It's creepy. He like predicts the future five years ahead of it. Um, yeah, I feel like pattern recognition is my life. It really is interesting because he was talking about people. I remember I was kind of my mind was blown. They were in a virtual space in that story, and they really wanted to buy the perfect kimono to wear to this important meeting with the person who was running this other massively online community. And my favorite part of it was the Bay Bridge had been knocked out on both sides and people were living Mm -hmm. in the Bay Bridge and it was like its own community. Yeah. Every time I drive across the Bay Bridge, I think about that visual. Yeah. And I I wish they'd left the bridge up and turned it into a park and then it would have been perfect. When I saw they were building that other new part of the Bay Bridge, I said, why don't they leave Mm -hmm. the other stanchion that was ripped up metal instead of shipping it to China, which I think was what they did, make it into some park and some incredible yep. high line like feature. And they just mm-hmm. ripped it apart. It was so dumb, terrible lack yep. of creativity. All right, let's talk about building culture over uh, when remote, best practices, mm-hmm. things you built into the tool. How do we build that trust? How do we, how do we make this real when it's virtual? Yeah, I, I think so. Like to go meta a little bit, um, it, the the underlying issue is that many work practices are built on these informal, ad hoc interactions. So you don't intentionally build culture. Culture emerges through interactions in the kitchen or in the desk in the cubes or like how you show up at happy hour. So when you go remote, you don't have the opportunity for those informal interactions. So you have to be much more intentional about how you actually cultivate the the different types of interactions within your organization. So if you look at the best companies, um, best remote companies, they're just incredibly intentional about their culture. They essentially design it. And um, this is something I talk to a lot with um, startup founders is design your company like a product. You have all these tools for how you make great products, apply the same principles to how you build your company. So look at the problems you're trying to solve, look at the user needs, and then and then work through that to identify um, the processes and practices that, that work for your company. And it's the same with remote. Um, I think a few things I'd say immediately, because that's probably a bit too abstract, would be to essentially create a cadence. Um, so what your check in So uh, like think about the week as having bookends at the start and the end. So maybe all hands briefing at the beginning of the week and then a, a recap where you do some fun stuff at the end of the week. And then over the course of the week, what are the check- check-in points? So we check in asynchronously daily, and then each team has these collaboration hours um, twice a week where they get together and problem solve, do demos, um, just like t- talk, talk as a team. And that creates this nice rhythm to the week, and that creates this backbone um, of culture building. 
Yeah, I, I've always had my entire career, um, you know, for two decades and three startups, uh, lunch with Jason on Wednesdays. It's just like mm-hmm. called the CEO lunch, which really doesn't have an agenda. People like to introduce agendas and make it the staff meeting. I just call it lunch. And, I, mm-hmm. and I've always had this problem where I would try to order great food from like a very unique place and make the lunch amazing and beautiful. And like, this is the hot new restaurant in San Francisco. Somebody drove over there in an Uber. They don't deliver. We got the food. We brought it here. We told everybody what the lunch was. It's from this new barbecue joint. And just try to mm-hmm. make it a little bit more special. Um, mm-hmm. And I got like resistance on that. I, I'm curious how you deal with people who are, I don't want to say culture killers, but culture resistant. So you're trying to build a culture. We were talking about EODs. I had somebody who was, I wouldn't say at the highest performer, but a, a solid contributor. And when I asked him to do EODs, he just kind of like blew a gasket. He's no longer here, obviously, but it's just like totally <laughs> felt yeah. like I didn't trust him. And I was like, it's not about trust. It's about knowing what's getting done so that I can be informed as the person who's responsible for $30 million of capital being deployed and you being one of the top three lieutenants. Like yeah. I, I, I have a, a, a duty here. This is beyond your ego or my, you know, being a, a taskmaster. And this is, has to do with yeah. our fiduciary responsibility to investors. Yeah. I mean, I think this is one of the hardest things in management is I, I, it's essentially diagnosing the, like the behavior and the, and the root cause. And um, in this case, maybe he was fearful, like he was insecure about his work and that he thought he was being monitored. Um, so there are things that potentially were systemic that affected it, um, but there can also be, again, like values misalignment. And I think one way to think about teams is are you a golf team or a basketball team? So golf teams, like the, they, they go out and they, do, they play their game and then they add the scarf at the end. Some people love working that way. Other people want to be a basketball team where you do the play together and you're passing the ball around and it's very dynamic. Yes. And if there's, if there's a mismatch between those two, it's, it's just going to be like a non-starter because you can't have a you can't have a, so, a solo player on a basketball team. Like you have to play as a team. Mm, um, I love that metaphor. Can you have those two types of teams in one company? Within a company, yeah. And I think that's actually one of the super interesting things that I've learned over the last year working with our customers is that the variance between companies is often... often lower than the variance within a company. So two teams at Twitter might look way different, more different than a, tw- a team at Twitter and like a, a 30 person startup that we're working with. Um, so it's really, it's really, really quite interesting. What, what does psychological safety mean? I know there was a, st- people hear this term a lot. I, w- I want to really get your definition yeah. of it because I know they did a survey at Google mm-hmm. on teams and that was yeah. the number one. And, and we had um, um, Kim Scott, Formerly mm-hmm. Kim, uh, I forgot her last. Yeah, Kim's great. Yeah, and and she was my AdSense rep back in the day. I, I knew her by her previous last name, which I'm just drawing a blank on here. Uh, but she did the book Radical Candor. But psychological safety came up over and over and over again in that study when they looked at people in these yeah. groups. And let's face it, you know, Google's got very unique kind of individuals, I would say. Yeah. Honestly, this is kind of one of my pet peeves because the concept of psychological safety is around for decades and it wasn't. Um, really acknowledged until Google did their project Aristotle as being something that was worth paying attention to. And now everyone talks about psychological safety. But essentially, if you look at great teams and, and great performers, they, people act in, um, in ways without fear. So they don't fear negative consequences to themselves um, through failure or speaking up. So if I'm in a staff meeting and my boss proposes a project and I think that project's got a really big problem with it. If I don't have psychological safety, I won't speak up and, and warn them because I'm worried about reprisals on me in that meeting. If I have psychological safety, I will speak up and say, hey, you haven't thought about this other issue. And then you get the most out of the team. So psychological safety essentially means you feel accepted and respected by your peers and that you can act without fear. And you see this in professional sports when a teammate, when teammates get in a fight and it cracks. Um, there was a famous photo of LeBron James um, when he had J.R. Smith on his team, and J.R. Smith is a, a head case uh, on a good day. I don't know if you follow, you follow basketball. I don't follow basketball, no. Okay, so just imagine having somebody who is like, yeah, um, <laughs> would like literally light a cigar up in the locker room like in 2020. or he, he, Literally, J.R. Smith was known for when they were, when he was on the Knicks, people were shooting free throws, and while during the game, he would lean over and untie another player's shoes. 
And he did it like three or four times, like completely inappropriate, like Dennis Rodman, like behavior. And there's this famous photo of like, he, he didn't take a timeout or he, he called a timeout when they didn't have one. And LeBron James is like crying with his hands and his palms up like, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. And it became this iconic image. Uh, and now people use it. It's become memed because it's when your teammate does something so incredibly stupid that you're so incredibly disappointed. They don't play together anymore. Um, and, and there's the images. LeBron James is so upset. And it's like, but it's more disappointment than anger. Um, and uh, then you had uh, obviously the Kevin Durant uh, and uh, Draymond Green also kind of like breaking down. H mm -hmm. How does team hold each other accountable you know in intense situations yeah. where a lot is at stake and emotions yeah. are high where how does one keep the expectation high you know uh, address the fact that yes emotions can run high when high things are at stake like an nbm championship or a startup's mm -hmm. very existence or a major yeah. investment unpack that for me of how to be intense yeah. and have high expectation culture and psychological safely at the same yeah. time. Yeah, I mean, I think I would argue that you you don't have accountability without psychological safety. Um, so let's take the example where um, someone's got this bad idea in a meeting and I don't feel able to, to speak up about it. Do you think I am now committed to that project? I am now not committed to that project because I'm like, I know it's going to fail because I've had this belief that I just, but I'm just not able to speak up about it. Mm. Then as the project goes on, I will not be... I will always have that in the back of my mind that that's not going to be successful. And then when it doesn't succeed, like I don't have any ownership in the lack of success because um, like I never thought about that in the first place. So I think what's great about psychological safety is it allows you to have that conflict and it allows you to speak up and disagree with each other. It doesn't mean having lack of emotions. It doesn't mean not arguing or making, you know, I think maybe LeBron James had a huge amount of psychological safety because he was able to yell at his teammate and know that they'd be able to get back together and yeah. play play the rest of the game. So I think if you want a highly successful team, you want to get the most out of everyone. And in order to get the most out of everyone, you need to make sure that they feel able to speak up and represent themselves. What's the difference, if a difference at all, in this culture building when you have introverts and extroverts who have very different concepts and constructs around culture? What is culture to mm -hmm. an introvert that I don't understand as an extrovert who says culture should be us all having dinner or us playing tennis or us going on a hike or us doing like some crazy activity together and introverts, mm -hmm. that's not what they want to do necessarily. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think introverts don't, they don't want a lack of emotional and social connection. It's just, it's more difficult for them and they... They still seek connection. It's just in different ways, and um, extroverts can feel overwhelming to them. So I think this goes to aspects of inclusion, and it's um, creating environments where everyone can be involved. So can you create a team building effort that works really great for the extroverts that want to jump up, up on stage and do a karaoke, as well as the introverts who might just want to play a board game or a game of poker, and having like a mix and match of activities that can speak to different energy levels. And the reality is that most people are on a spectrum. Um, between introvert and extrovert and they they oscillate up and down that spectrum and at different times so people can be more extroverted or less extroverted on a given day so it's just being thoughtful about that and creating environments which accommodate different people yeah you worked with evan williams good friend of mine and i, I think sometimes evan doesn't know how to like actually handle being in the same room with me i think he's entertained but he's a yeah. he's a super thoughtful introverted guy you see also throws amazing singing, parties but he has incredibly great parties Right, and he does. He sings songs in front of the whole company. So, yes, so he, he operates in that spectrum. What do you think is holacracy thing that he tried, and uh, my friend Tony Shea tried? Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you're part of that holacracy camp. I was, yeah. You were. <laughs> from were day, you from day one? Yeah. Did you insert holacracy? Are you the cause of it? And what do you think is the legacy of that? It seemed very promising, and then I don't hear about it anymore. Yeah. Tell everybody what yeah, so, it is and what the what the arc has been for holacracy, holacracy. So, um, so Ev, Ev brought it into Medium, um, and he'd talked with Tony Shea and a few other people and thought it sounded like an interesting model. Um, and uh, the way to think about holacracy is essentially, it's essentially a rule set. They call themselves an operating system, but it's a rule set for how to run the company, and it's oriented around notion of self governance. So, in the ideal world. Um, a team is completely autonomous and can describe their own work and describe how they work and um, has processes for evolving that. Um, 
which might sound not that extreme, but it has a very rigorous rule set that um, kind of keeps the, it from becoming chaotic. Um, so there's t teams are circles, and then circles can have circles inside, and then you have roles. So it detaches a uh, title from role, which is kind of interesting, and has explicit uh, accountabilities. Um, and then it has these processes for how you modify the constitution, as it were, or how you resolve what they call tensions or like issues, um, which is based on other practices like sociocracy, which has like integrative decision making, which is another formal process for resolving um, resolving hard decisions in a in a um, in a group. Um, so has it worked it about... anywhere? Because holacracy was a new concept. I know Tony kind of, I don't know if he deprecated yeah. it or he he kind of uh, took the gas off of it. And I, and I know Evan yeah. took the gas off it. People wanted more structure is what I heard from both of them is that people didn't want to be responsible in large part of defining their role. They wanted their role defined for them, but they wanted autonomy in it. Was that the, was that the yeah, tension it, in that? You think? The, the irony... The irony about Holacracy is it ended up being pretty black and white. And it's like, yeah, this is the way that you do things. And if you don't like doing these things, then Holacracy doesn't work for you. And <laughs> what we realized was that you needed, you can't have the system that you designed your company has to adapt and it has to be situational for the team, for the people, and um, both on what they want for, in their role, but also in their ability. So there's this notion of situational leadership where you you flex up and down your level of control based on the ability for the team. Holacracy didn't have that. So it was just very... It felt very chaotic, and then as we were scaling the company, you know, we were doubling every year. It just took a lot of time to onboard people and teach them how to do things. So the the rule set got in the way of itself, and mm. it it was empowering, but it was also slow. And you can't, you may have been able to resolve all the problems with it, but we just didn't have the time or the luxury to do it through the through the formal processes. Um, but oh, at one point, um, so Jen, my co-founder, and I were the people that we moved us off holacracy to an, a new a new model. Um, which we grew internally. But as we were doing that, we kind of joked that half the problem was the name Holacracy and then the dogma surrounded it. Like people, it had this weird life of its own and this belief of like what it meant. And the, the best word is dogma. And then that meant that that got in the way of the company. So it's not like, how do we solve this problem? It's like, how do we do this thing in Holacracy? And then we spend all the time talking about Holacracy instead of the thing you were trying to solve. So it got it got in the way of itself. That is so meta. It literally became like a religion. So everything you looked at, you were looking through yeah. it through the lens of this Bible or these commandments or this dogma. And that, yeah. that's not how problems are solved. And I really like what you said there is like, it, things are situational there might be a team member who is so transcendent at doing something that everybody else gets out of the way and lets them do it in mm -hmm. a certain situation. Then there might be yeah. other situations which are confounding and new, and you wanna bring in twice as many people and have 10 times as many ideas, right? Like mm -hmm. sometimes you're sending right. in a sniper team and they're going to take out the target. Or Osama bin Laden, you're sending in like a, you know, the, the SEALs. Other times, mm -hmm. you might need to be like, this is diplomacy time, or maybe we're gonna take yeah. a, a, a an economic approach to solving this problem with the mm -hmm. Taliban. I, I'm sorry, I'm just watching yeah. uh, the new, uh, season of Homeland. <laughs> yeah. But you know, there's there's different approaches, right? And it flexes even with an individual. So um, you have a high performer who is generally you delegate like problems to them, and you, and they just run with it. Um, maybe they're going through a stressful period, or they're returning from like paternity leave or something like that, and then you 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 give them much smaller tasks during that period while they're ramping back up. Mm. So that that's the power of good leadership is that you come up with um, the right method of management or right method of leadership in the moment for the right situation, the right person. Yeah, see, and that's the was just very dogmatic. Yeah, that's the art of it. It's like, you might have a high performer, but they're coming back from an injury. And you say, mm -hmm. I, I know that you're a starter. I know you're Kevin Durant. We want you to come off the bench. We want you to play 20 minutes. We want to see what's going on with that Achilles heel. Uh, we, we just want you to take, you know, five or 10 shots. Let, let, you don't need to like dunk the ball, Let, let's just get you into some spot up three point shooting, get you warmed right. up and, and let, then we'll, you know, slowly increase you back to whatever mm -hmm. speed. But the problem is sometimes people are like, they just rush people back and they just get re-injured or, or they're not ready for it, right? And yeah, Exactly, yeah. That That's the yes. job of a great manager. Who's the best manager uh, alive today in business? Anybody you look to or any historical person you look to based on their bio, Obviously, you didn't work for everybody, but just from an outward perspective, you look at it and say, you know, that's a gold standard right there. That's that's yeah. somebody who does a really great job. Yeah, I, I I don't know off the top of my head. I think it's such a difficult question because um, the external perspective of people can be so different to the perspective 
of the people who you know report f to them or work for them. Um, so I, I hazard to name a person, unfortunately, um, yeah. which is maybe a cop out. But I think I think often I've been surprised many times where there's been someone who I thought must be like the best person to work for, and then I've heard stories about actually how it's really terrible, and vice versa, where someone who on the surface seems um, you know, relatively uninspirational and um, potentially, you know, not not very motivating is like the one of the best people that they've ever worked for. It really is fascinating, isn't it? Like, and I think it also has to do with the stage of life. If you look at somebody like Steve Jobs or or Bill Gates, you know, there were these stories of them being terrors in the beginning mm -hmm. of their lives, and then there are these yep. stories of them being exceptional later in their lives. On uh, to, to be human to the point of you know, just saint-like, you know, there's a great moment in the Bob Iger book where um, Bob Iger's uh, book where he's uh, buying Pixar for Disney and mm -hmm. Steve Jobs takes him on the side and says, listen, I got to tell you, I know we're about to announce, yep. but you can back out if you want. I'm, my cancer's back and I know I'm a big part of this. I'm going to be your biggest shareholder. And I understand if you don't want to buy this, knowing that I may not be here in six months and you're like, oh my God. And like, <laughs> Did you read yep. it yet, Bob Iger's book? I haven't read it, no. It's a but, great um, listen, a great book. I mean, he, he really has to go through this like incredible moment of like, oh my God, mm -hmm. Steve Jobs yeah, is not going to be here and I'm going to buy this company. I might, I might have bought this knowing Steve Jobs is going to die and then I can't tell the world he's going to die quickly mm -hmm. in all likelihood. And that's material information or is it not material? And, and then how do, how do I process that even? It's a really amazing mm -hmm. human moment. Yeah. One thing that you said though, um, there, there are these theories of adult cognitive development and that as you, um, it's, it's mostly tied to age, but it's not perfectly tied to age, it's tied to experience. Um, but the way that your mind makes meaning of the world evolves um, mm. throughout your life. It used to be thought of it being fixed. So as you, as you hit these different levels of cognition, you start thinking more from the system's point of view versus the group or for more for, uh, egocentric. So you can, you can chart people's biographies through that, that, that journey. Um, and that, that that's, um, a lens to view, say, like Jobs' journey on. I yeah, I I've, it's interesting that it's chronological. I also think there's milestones that affect people. So mm -hmm. I watch when people make, you know, a large amount of money and that, or have a large amount of demonstrable success, and they don't feel like their failure is yep. imminent. Which mm -hmm. you know, like, uh, there were moments where it looked like Twitter was going to fail, like they couldn't mm -hmm. even keep the servers up. And so for somebody, just to take out of a mutual friend of ours, like. I, I don't. I, I don't work for. Did never work with Ev, but I get the. I get the sense that the level of safety and freedom he has, having had the great success of Twitter, and then previously, you know, the moderate yeah. success of Blogger, gave him a freedom with Medium that he can really, you know, take his time and and he's not under mm -hmm. some existential threat to, to to be you know, uh, yeah. like maybe somebody like you know who's under the pressure right now, like the Airbnb founders might be right now at this very yeah, moment. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it relates to, I think Maslow, again, like 60s um, old research, but again, has relevance today. And his pyramid isn't as meant to be as dogmatic as we currently believe it to be. It's much more uh, like a fluid um, st set of stages that you progress through and, uh, and can go up and down dynamically. But yeah, totally. If you if you have all your material needs taken care of, that, that frees you up. Um, uh, to take more risks, and then you also have like emotional needs and you know other other needs. But if you can start checking those things off, then yeah, it frees you up to to do things that otherwise would hold you back. Amazing! This has been a great hour uh, with Daniel Pupias. Hey, Daniel, I don't I don't know if my producer asked you, but um, I would love it if you would do in the um, in the founder Slack this week in startups dot com Slack and AMA. Maybe if you could carve out forty five minutes yeah, to talk about to. range. Uh, so there you have it, folks. We've got our third AMA coming soon. If you're listening to this. Join the Slack group this week in startups.com slash Slack. It's free. All we ask is that you be a good human. Consider it a dinner party. Uh, like you got invited to a kick-ass dinner party and you want to get invited back. Just have conversations. Don't go to there to market. Don't go to there to spam. Don't go to there to fill the top of your funnel. Like the people dropping eBooks and cigarette sensation products. Go in there and just have a normal conversation about what you're going through. Be a human. And, uh, superhuman dan you will be there as well uh doing an ama everybody go check out range.co um and are you hiring now or are you uh just building yeah we're looking for um, a couple of engineers um but mostly mostly just keeping it lean will you consider a remote engineer at this point or do they have to mm -hmm. be in your den no, we, 
Now we're um, we've always decided designed the company as being remote friendly. Okay. Uh, we have people who like working in the same office, so we did we had we did have an office. We shut it down. Um, but yeah, permanently we're remote. or and well, we think I think there's going to be shelter in place on and off for quite a while. So we were saving saving the expense, and we'll reestablish an HQ if and when. Uh, well, let's assume it is coming is back. I'm curious how you think about it as the founder CEO. Do you want to have an office again? Or I, I think we have we have people on the team who like. They, they just like working in an office. They like having that space and then yeah. they like the interactions. I think it doesn't become a requirement for work. Like even previously um, on any given day, only half the team would be in the office. People would work from coffee shops or remotely. Um, so it's more of a, a meeting place, a formal meeting place than a, like a, an office. So we will have one eventually. Um, I just don't know if that's three months, six months or like 18 months. I'm thinking of a new thing. I'm thinking of having a hybrid for the rest of the year because we're going to be coming back where we do um, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, really intense in the office. And then Monday, Friday, you work from home and it can be less intense, but we do this like really intense group work um, over three days. What do you think of that? Yeah, I think I, I think there's some really interesting hybrid solutions in the future. I imagine an office where you have maybe some desks for people who want to work in the office the whole time. Then you have some temporary areas where Sweetie. you have kind of like these transient people who come through the office and then you have re remote friendly collaboration areas so i think the future of work is actually really interesting and it's kind of accelerated over the last few months mm. um and i'm pretty excited about where we end off me too all right with that uh i'll thank you for coming on the pod and i'll see you in the ama um, Sweet. and uh to everybody out there uh dealing with this pandemic um nobody has the answers Nobody has all the answers, right? We're learning. We're getting through it uh, together. Uh, be kind to each other. Make a little bit of space for debate, um, especially when we try to figure out going back. Should we do it? Should we not? Everybody is under stress. The people who are, you know, delivering packages all the way up to the CEOs, the investors, politicians. Man, this is trying for everybody to try to sort this out. It's psychologically brutal for everybody. Just make a little space. Just make a little space and check in on the people you love because... People might be putting up a good front, but I can tell you people are hurting, even if they're, you know, powerful people or they seem otherwise successful. Th this is having a psychological impact on everybody. So just a little bit of space for everybody, a little bit of kindness, uh, I think, and a little bit of self-care. Okay, everybody take care of yourselves. We'll see you next time on This Week in Startups.